Okay, we are going to continue looking into uh, we are going to continue looking into this uh, Laplace approximation for neural networks, um, and we are going to see some of the old papers from the '90s uh, and from David Mackay uh, and some more recent works uh, of these techniques. Uh, so now we have seen that we can obtain accurate approximations uh, using this uh, linearized uh, uh, approach for predictions. Uh, if you don't do that and you just sample from the Gaussian, it doesn't work so well. Uh, one other, other thing that you could do is the Laplace approximation gives you an estimate of the marginal likelihood the probability that the model gives to the data once you integrate out the model parameters. And we saw yesterday um, with uh, Mark how this is a good approach to do model selection. The marginal likelihood you can interpret as how your model, the probability that your model gives to the data in an online fashion when you have to make predictions uh, for one new data point uh, given the previous ones. Uh, with this Laplace approximation, we obtain this estimate of the marginal likelihood. It's just the log posterior evaluated at W map. Uh, and then you have the extra term here that uh, includes the log determinant of minus the, the log target, uh, the log target density. So we can now try to tune hyperparameters, in particular the prior precision. This was the balance of my prior, this value alpha. Here is the, the, inverse, the inverse balance of my prior. And it's going to determine how much I favor the value of the small weights, no? how much I favor to shrink my weights. And typically, typically in neural networks, that's going to enforce your model to be smooth and simple. Uh, so I could now uh, tune these uh, hyperparameters instead of by cross-validation, where I have to split the data uh, I could just uh, do numerical optimization of this quantity. Uh, to do that, I just need to compute gradients, and I know how to compute derivatives. Uh, so this thing doesn't depend on uh, this thing doesn't depend on alpha. So I can ignore this, ignore this. Here, there is alpha. Uh, this is alpha, and this may depend also on alpha as well. Uh, the derivative of this is going to be very easy. This is also very easy to do. And now the log determinant, this A depends on alpha. No, Just uh, if you go back and we look at uh, the value of uh, A, A includes uh, alpha here. So I need to ac account for that when I compute gradients. Uh, there is more that I need to account, but uh, I'm not mentioning that now. So I can compute the gradient of the log determinant. Uh, the log determinant is just the, the sum of the log eigenvalues of my matrix. And now A is obtained by summing the log likelihood and the log prior. The log prior is just the identity times alpha, and the eigenvalues of that is going to be just uh, alpha. And now this lambda I are going to be uh, eigenvalues from the log likelihood. Um, Now I, I take the derivative of this, and this is one over uh, the quantity because of the derivative of the logarithm. Uh, anyway, you can uh, easily replace this expression back into the original expression for the model evidence, and now compute the derivative of this with respect to alpha is just a W map, uh, transpose W map divided by two, and then this derivative also is the same. If I do a bit of algebra, I will end up with a solution like this. Alpha is equal to gamma divided by W map transpose times W map. And then this is a very simple and intuitive expression. If you have a balance parameter in a Gaussian and uh, you need to uh, estimate that balance by maximum likelihood, there is a very simple expression for that. I just compute the empirical balance of my data. No? And that's the maximum likelihood estimate for uh, my balance. Uh, so here, the data is just the point estimate of the weights that I have obtained. And now uh, I want to estimate the balance of that. The mean of my prior is zero. 
So I just take the sum of the uh, squares, the sum of the squared weights, and then I'm going to divide by the number of weights. And that represents a point estimate for my prior balance. The main difference is that here I'm not uh, dividing by the number of weights. This is precision, so that's why I have uh, the squared sum of weights in the denominator. And then this gamma is not the total number of weights, uh, it's just uh, this sum of quantities. And these are eigenvalues of the log likelihood and then eigenvalues of the prior. And this quantity is going to be zero if the eigenvalues of the log likelihood go to zero. That means that the log likelihood doesn't tell me much or constrain me much in that direction. If one of these eigenvalues is zero, the log likelihood doesn't constrain me much uh, there. Uh, but the uh, eigenvalue could be very large. And that means that uh, in that direction, if I change my weights across that direction, the log likelihood is going to change quite a lot. So this thing, uh, you can actually give an interpretation, which is the effective number of well-determined parameters according to how your uh, model fits the data. So if the eigenvalues of the log likelihood are close to zero, uh, that direction is not very well determined. I could take different values of the weights across that direction and the, the fit to the data would be more or less the same. Um, but if the eigenvalue is very large, if the eigenvalue is very large, this quantity is going to go to one, no? Because I have lambda in the numerator and in the denominator. So if the eigenvalue is very large, this goes to one, and then I'm just counting the number of directions where the log likelihood actually is quite constrained. I cannot change my weights much across those directions because then I, I won't fit the data well. So this represents the effective number of well-determined parameters. Um, which has like a very intuitive meaning. And then this looks very similar to then a, a way to, uh, to choose uh, the inverse prior variance just by maximum likelihood, but I'm not dividing by the number of weights, I'm dividing by the effective number of, uh, of, of weights. Um, anyway, uh, you could do something similar for the noise precision beta, the same stuff, you just take your marginal likelihood uh, compute uh, derivatives with respect to beta. I won't get much into the details, but you will obtain a similar expression, which is now the sum of the squared errors of your model. And now you are dividing not by the total number of data points, you are subtracting this uh, number of uh, uh, well determined uh, parameters here. The effective number of well determined uh, parameters. So these expressions. Uh, appear in uh, David Mackay's thesis. Uh, and he showed that uh, by training your neural network, obtaining a point estimate of the weights, evaluating the marginal likelihood approximation like this, and then updating uh, alpha and beta according to these expressions. So you get an expression here for alpha and another expression here for beta. Uh, the only thing that you need is this gamma, which is related to the eigenvalues of the Hessian. Uh, which, uh, which can be found here. Uh, you can then update those parameters and then you are guaranteed to improve the marginal likelihood approximation when you do this. There is one caveat here, uh, which I didn't mention which is that this um, W map, we found W map by optimizing the, the log posterior. And that log posterior also depends on the prior balance or the noise precision. So W map actually depends also on these hyperparameters. And I was ignoring that dependence here. Uh, so this means that I can find a, an approximation of the marginal likelihood according to these expressions. And I can reupdate alpha and beta, but then I have to find a new value of uh, W map because now the hyperparameters have changed and my uh, point estimate of the weights, uh, my maximizer of the log posterior is going to change as well. Uh, so in the end, uh, maybe, maybe we can see this. This is, uh, I mean, we'll see that later. So I will have to repeat the training process several times. 
So train my neural network, find W map, obtain a Gaussian approximation, estimate the marginal likelihood using that Gaussian approximation, optimize the hyperparameters, maximizing my approximation of the marginal likelihood, and then I repeat the process until uh, the whole thing converges. Uh, and it usually converges very fast. Um, so let's have a look at how this works in practice. This, this is a paper that was uh, published uh, a few years after David Mackay's thesis. And uh, it showed uh, how this approach of hyperparameter tuning works in practice. David Mackay also had similar results in his thesis. There is something interesting, and this is kind of the, the type of networks that people were using in, in the 90s. Uh, you can see here something. This is the number of hidden units in this network. <laughs> so it's a network with six hidden units, and uh, it shows this data set and uh, how you would obtain some solution here without doing hyperparameter tuning. Uh, and you can see that the model is actually overfitting, even, even though it has only six solutions, uh, the model is overfitting and it's clearly describing this as, as noise. Uh, you can tune hyperparameters using this approach. Uh, uh, it's a small, a slight variation of what uh, David Magai proposed, but it's more or less the same in the end. Uh, and you can find this solution that actually fits the data very well and it doesn't overfit. Uh, if you actually go to MATLAB, there is a toolbox that implements uh, Bayesian training of neural networks with automatic hyperparameter tuning, and it's based on this technique uh, uh, described by David Mackay, and it, it gives you solutions that are uh, quite robust over fitting as, as this one shown here. Cool. So this shows that these methods uh, work well in practice. Um, now. There is one limitation of this approach. Uh, and uh, one of the things that can happen is that we may train our neural network. We uh, use, for example, a, a second order optimizer for this, and we may obtain some point estimate for the weights. And when we look at the Hessian of the log of the minus log posterior, it may not be positive definite. Because with neural networks, you may get stuck in some uh, shuttle points, for example. Uh, and that can give you problems uh, because you may run this method, you get now a uh, matrix of second derivatives, and that's not a uh, positive definite. And that cannot be the covariance of Hagasian. Uh, so, one approach that you could follow to avoid this problem is to Instead of using the Hessian directly, you could use an approximation to the Hessian, which is called the Gauss-Newton uh, approximation or the generalized Gauss-Newton approximation for uh, models with, with not uh, just Gaussian noise. Uh, and the idea is very simple. Now, what you are going to do is to replace your original neural network again also by this linear model that we mentioned before. The same linear model that David Mackay was using you could just uh, replace the output of your neural network by the output of that linear model, which is now linear in W. We have it here as in blue. And then we compute now the Hessian in this uh, model. Um, when you do that, you obtain this uh, generalized Gauss-Newton approximation to the Hessian, which has this expression. Uh, the first time is the same as the prior. This, the first time here is the, the same as before for the prior. And now we have here some uh, vectors of Jacobians uh, and some matrices G, which is the matrix G is just uh, the second derivative of the log likelihood with respect to the uh, output of the neural network. So this, this uh, approximation to the Hessian is now a sum over data points. And you just take the uh, Jacobian vectors, which are just the output of the neural network uh, with respect to the, uh, to the weights, and you multiply them on the left and on the right with this matrix G, with, which is the second derivative of the log likelihood. <clears throat> the main advantage of this approximation is that it is guaranteed to be positive uh, definite. And it's, going, it's guaranteed to give us a, a Gaussian approximation uh, that, that is going to work. Uh, 
This matrix was also used by many uh, second order optimization algorithms, uh, which means that you just run your second order optimization algorithm and it's going to calculate this matrix. And you don't really need to do much to get your uh, Gaussian approximation. You just take the same matrix used by the optimization algorithm. Uh, and then you can use that also to, to obtain your uncertainties and to do model selection. <clears throat> Good, uh, so that can solve some of the problems. Now let's see the whole approach, how it would work in practice. We choose some initial values for the hyperparameters, the noise precision and the prior precision. We train uh, the neural network, trying to find some maximizer of the log likelihood of the log posterior. And this could be done using any method. Uh, we find uh, maybe some, uh, some value for W map. We do a few cycles of optimization. We don't really have to, to optimize to convergence. We obtain our uh, generalized Gauss Newton approximation to the Hessian. Then we obtain this parameter gamma that is key to estimate alpha and beta by computing the eigen decomposition of A. We obtain gamma with that expression, and then we update alpha and beta using the same equations given by David Mackay. Uh, and then we will iterate this process a few times. Typically, this converges very fast. Uh, and then this parameter gamma is, quite, is going to be quite interesting to see if we are choosing the right model or not. Uh, we said that this is the, the number of well-determined parameters. And we can compare that to the total number of weights. Uh, if it is close to D, it seems that our network is very well determined by the data. And maybe that's actually not good because we could be in the underfitting regime. Maybe we would need a bit more flexibility. So we could add more neurons. Uh, if actually gamma uh, uh, could be very small, then maybe we are in the uh, overfitting regime and we may want to reduce the number of uh, neurons. Anyway, this is just a as a, a list of steps that you could apply to implement this in practice. Uh, any more questions on this, by the way? No? Yes. Does it matter a lot how we set the initial value in the first step? Um, probably something reasonable is okay. Crazy things could make things crash. <laughs> um, yeah, so typically, for example, you would uh, normalize, you would uh, standardize your data. Uh, and then uh, beta, for example, is the noise. So this something reasonable could be to initialize this to to the balance of your outputs. For example, if your balance of your outputs, imagine that the balance of your outputs is small, and then you see just the beta, so that the, the noise balance is massive, then it could be very slow to learn your method. So uh, you could use some heuristics. I mean, people probably describe this in, in the papers, and there are some rules that you could follow for this. Yeah. So the, the last step is, is, is network, if larger network has same final uh, gamma, then the smaller network was enough. So we have to do quite like pruning, using this technique for pruning models or something like that. Um, I'm pretty sure someone has done something like that. <laughs> I know the details, I mean, that there's tons of work on, on how to prune networks. Uh, there are some papers by Lecum on optimal brain damage on how to prune networks. And I think he has some techniques that are actually similar in speed of these things. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that some people have, have thought about doing this. And uh, if you think about this automatic relevance determination that David Mackay was doing, you could assign the same prior balance to the weights of a neuron. And if you're optimizing this prior balance uh, and the, the balance goes to zero, then that neuron is removed because all the weights are zero. So you could think of doing something like that as well. Uh, cool, more things. Let's think about classification. In classification problems, you could actually say, do the same approximations that we saw before. We saw this uh, logistic regression model. Uh, if you have a binary classifier, you could do the same thing and you can get some uh, some estimate of the predictive balance and then divide the input to your logistic function by the square root of one plus pi divided by eight. Uh, you may have a multi-class classification problem and you could also do similar approximations in this case. So you just take the input to your softmax 
this will be the point estimates given by the deterministic neural network. And then you could just uh, scale down the input to the softmax by this quantity. So it's just a generalization uh, from what you do in the logistic case to the softmax. The logistic function and the softmax are related. Uh, you can show that the two are the same. So if we are scaling the input to the logistic function by the predictive variance, we could do the same with the softmax. And there are some works also uh, uh, proposing this. So let's have a look at how this works also. This is from uh, some uh, journal paper uh, based on the thesis of David Mackay, and he shows a classification problem. The quality of these figures are not great. These are papers from the 90s, so you didn't have like a, all the techniques that you have now available for doing ni nice figures. Uh, you could have now, uh, these are squares and uh, asterisks or stars. And uh, you find a map uh, solution. These are the predictions that you obtain. And when you do the Laplace approximation, you obtain higher uncertainty. For example, in this region here, where there is, where there is no data, you have higher uncertainty as shown here. And in this region also here, where there is no data, also you have higher uncertainty. Uh, so, okay, it seems to be doing a good job. Uh, now, uh, we're going to see more recent stuff uh, on this. Uh, Let's have first a look at some simple comparisons with other baselines. This is some work that uh, a PhD student here in Cambridge did, uh, Andrew Fung, uh, Fung. And here we compare uh, mean field variational inference uh, with the linear Isla Plus and Hamilton Monte Carlo. And we see that mean field variational inference tends to underestimate uncertainty, especially in these regions in between the data. And we see that the linear is Laplace actually doesn't have this problem, which is really, really nice. Uh, in this experiment, we compare this uh, linear is Laplace mo method with the sample Laplace, and we found basically the same as what uh, Neil Lawrence was reporting. So this is the, uh, where is this thing? So this is the sampled one, and you see that it doesn't do very well. And the uh, linear is Laplace is, is higher. This is predictive log likelihood. And it outperforms, for example, mean field variational inference in, in many cases. Uh, there is another case where we actually uh, see that this method works very well. And it's, it's a setting that is called the gap splits. And this is uh, precisely focused on looking at how well the uncertainty uh, estimates uh, are doing in regions where we don't have much data. So the idea here is not to split the data into uh, independent training and test sets, just uh, choosing them uniformly at random. But imagine that you have a feature that has this uh, empirical distribution. We could just uh, choose maybe some points, maybe here and maybe here. And we just say, this is going to be all the data points that fall in this region are going to be in the test set. And my training set only has data points for which I have data here. So this creates now test splits where you are trying to make predictions for regions where you don't have inputs for a particular feature. And that's going to force the model to make predictions uh, uh, far from your training data. And uh, what we see is that in uh, general, this linear is Laplace is quite robust. And there are some settings here, specifically in these problems of energy and naval. For example, you can see here uh, mean, field, mean field variational inference here, that's really horrible. Uh, and here we have like a map solution also that that's horribly bad. And the linear is Laplace is shown with this circle here much higher and, and doing better. So it's, it's making very good predictions in this uh, simple setting. Um, Cool. Now we are going to see something uh, quite important for the practical implementation of these methods. So far, we haven't really said anything about the computational cost of this method. The computational cost of this method actually is not as straightforward because uh, we need to find a map solution. That's fine. You just maybe run some numerical optimization method. There are many different ways to train your network. You could do that. But then you need to work with this Hessian of the log 
target density. And the Hessian is a matrix of size, the number of weights times the number of weights. If you have massive networks and massive data sets, you are going to run into problems. You won't be able to work with this Hessian. Um, so what do can you do in that case? Uh, fortunately, there are quite nice approximations that you could do. And one of them is based on Chronicle products. This is the method that uh, Mark described in uh, his lecture yesterday. Uh, the idea here is we don't want to work with this massive Hessian. Uh, we need to, to work with a, or to find a way to represent this matrix in a more compact uh, way. And uh, you can do that using, using Chronicle products. Uh, who has seen Chronicle products before? Who is familiar with Chronicle products? Some people, but not many. <laughs> okay. So the Chronicle product of two matrices uh, is shown here. And I have, I have a matrix A, and I am computing the Chronicle product of that matrix with matrix B. And the result is going to be another matrix that has as number of rows and columns, the product of the number of rows of A and B, that's the number of rows of the product. And then the number of columns of the product is going to be the product of the number of columns in the two matrices. And the way I obtain this matrix is just by repeating B many times, but I am now multiplying it by each entry in matrix A, no? So for each entry in matrix A, I take matrix B, multiply it by that entry, and then I concatenate it uh, accordingly as how the entries in A are organized. So this matrix now could be huge, no? Because uh, imagine that the two matrices have the same size. This is now quadratic in the number of rows and in the number of columns, no? The number of, of rows in the product is just the square of the number of, of rows in the original matrices and so on. So chronicle products are very nice because they allow me to represent these huge matrices now in terms of two much simpler matrices. And chronicle products also have important properties. In particular, for example, the inverse of the chronicle product of uh, two matrices can be shown to be just uh, the chronicle product of the inverses. This means that I could have a massive matrix represented as the chronicle product of way smaller matrices compute the inverses of those smaller matrices, and then uh, I would have the, 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 the inverse matrix by just computing the, the chronicle product of the inverses. So it's a way of representing matrices in a compact way and uh, performing more efficient uh, computations. Instead of working with massive matrices directly, I operate with the, the chronicle factors. Why is this important? It's important because you can actually show that the Hessian in, um, in the neural networks for one data point, if you have the log likelihood of only one data point, you can show that the Hessian uh, has this chronicle product extractor. Um, we're going to focus only on the weights for a particular layer, but you can show that if WL is the weight matrix for a particular layer, uh, you can show that this generalized uh, Gauss-Newton uh, matrix that we talked before, uh, the part of that matrix corresponding to the weights in that layer has a chronicle product structure. And it's going to be the, uh, this matrix, which is just the, the outer product of the, uh, the inputs to the layer. A is just the, the inputs to my layer. No? H uh, it could be the inputs to the nonlinearity. The inputs to the layer is A. I multiply it by my weights, and then I get H, and then I would apply a nonlinearity. So you can take the inputs to the layer, do this outer product. This is now a matrix of size, the number of inputs to the layer, the number of inputs. And then I have a chronicle product here with another matrix, which I'm not going to describe in detail, but it's called the, the pre-activation uh, Gauss-Newton matrix. Uh, I don't think you can see it here, but it says pre-activation Gauss-Newton matrix. Uh, this is now a matrix, which is uh, the number of uh, uh, outputs to the layer, the number of outputs. Um, 
And when I compute uh, the Kronecker product between these two matrices, uh, I get a matrix, which is number of inputs, number of outputs, times number of inputs, number of outputs, which is precisely the number of weights in that layer. Uh, so you could do that then not for a single data point, but summing across data points. And then you can show that uh, for a particular layer in your, uh, in your network, the, the entries of the generalized gauss newton matrix for that layer are, have this form. It's the sum of these uh, chronicle products between uh, smaller matrices. And you do here another approximation. Uh, which is just uh, taking this sum inside of the chronicle product. Uh, this can be debatable how accurate this is. It seems that uh, things are still working in practice quite well. I, and you just say, uh, now for a particular layer, I can uh, go through my data, compute this sum of the smaller matrices, uh, and then compute the chronicle product of that. Uh, and by doing that, I get a quite accurate approximation to, to this uh, generalized gauss newton matrix. Uh, computing then the inverse of, uh, of these matrices, then can be done, it can be done also efficiently exploiting the properties of the chronicle products. Uh, good, so, so far, uh, so good with these approximations. All these... Uh, this work was done by uh, David Barber and some of his students, in particular, Alexander Botev. He has a PhD thesis, which is amazing, describing how you can apply these chronicle product approximations to, to, uh, to, uh, to the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix. And he actually used these techniques to obtain a scalable version of the Laplace approximation. And uh, he has some results in his thesis, which are quite interesting. Uh, so these are his results. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the work of Alexander is amazing. Uh, I just want to put that, it's really, really good. But he has these results in the thesis. Look, this is the full Laplace on this data set. Uh, some data points, the prediction shown in red, and then he shows this uh, line in blue with some uncertainties. And this would be like the approximations by the Kronecker uh, factorization. What happens in this plot? <laughs> Can someone say what's happening here? What happens? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes, this is the number of data points in your data set. Okay. <laughs> okay, so does anyone find any similarity between this plot and this one? It's the same problem. <laughs> it's the same problem. Uh, so Alexander, he did this amazing work uh, to obtain a scalable approximations of the generalized gauss newton matrix. And he just uh, applied the Laplace approximation as you would expect, just sampling from your Gaussian approximation. Uh, but Neil Lawrence already showed that that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he's making predictions uh, without this linearized model. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, the papers by Alexander, he tried to compensate this by introducing scaling factors. So I just shrink your uncertainty because otherwise things we know that it doesn't work with the, without the linearized approximation. Um, um, so he came up with hacks and the, the results that he is showing that actually not that great. But actually if you do the right thing and you use a linearized model for predictions, here, then, uh, the results work uh, amazingly well. Uh, and that's actually what, uh, what Alex and others uh, have proposed. Uh, so this generalized Gauss-Newton matrix, we have seen 
that it comes from replacing your original neural network that is not linear with a linearized model. And then you obtain the Hessian of this linearized uh, model. Uh, and that, 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 that gives you your generalized Gauss-Newton approximation. So if you use this uh, linearized model for making predictions, uh, sorry, for, for obtaining your generalized uh, Gauss-Newton approximation, then it makes sense also to make predictions with the same model. And actually, this is what David Magai was, was proposing to do in his work. Uh, so yeah, you should just use the linearized model for predictions. And you can still use the, the Kronecker uh, approximation. And uh, actually, it works great. It gives you very good results. Uh, and you can see that uh, you can obtain better results than the map solution. For example, in fashion MNIST, Cypher, uh, they show that uh, they, they obtain way better results than if you don't use the linearized model. Uh, and you can also even improve over the map solution. Uh, so that's good. Uh, you can also do hyperparameter tuning. Uh, you could uh, train your neural network. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is some uh, yeah some some additional metric that uh, looks at the quality of your predictions for out of distribution data. Uh, and maybe yeah, I know all the details of, on this, but this is predictive accuracy, predictive log likelihood. This is expected calibration error, and this is some measure on uh, out of distribution data uh, that you would expect the model to. Uh, I mean, to, to validate how, how good your answer and these are. Um, more details are in the paper. I don't remember all the details now. Yes. Sorry? Why they are so good at ECE? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you are getting better results here at least, no? For example, this one than the non linearized. Um, yeah, um, we are going to see some additional results that are better. Uh, I mean, in terms of negative log likelihood, here is slightly better. This one is not so different. Um, We're going to see later additional results that look at the uncertainties in out of distribution data, and we're going to see that they are way better than, than with other techniques. Can you repeat the question, sir? It looks at how well your predictive probabilities agree with the. Uh, for example, if you say my predictive probability of this class is 80%, you could look at the, the fraction of data points for which you make these predictions and you would expect to be 80% right there. So you, may, you measure the agreement between these things. Um, but yeah, so yeah, this, this is also based on the Kronecker factor approximation and this can also introduce uh, uh, additional approximations. And that could also deteriorate the, the, the quality of your predictive uh, uncertainties. Cool. Uh, so you can also do hyperparameter tuning. In the same way as what we saw before, uh, you can train your neural network, uh, then tune your hyperparameters, and then uh, continue training to do, you do a small update of your hyperparameters to maximize the marginal likelihood. Um, and uh, in this paper, uh, they show also that uh, you can obtain results that are actually as good as with uh, cross-validation. Uh, this is for different data sets. You look uh, at uh, predictive accuracy, predictive log likelihood, um, and on methods uh, trained with uh, cross-validation and with optimizing the marginal likelihood and 
the results are similar or better. So it's, it, it looks that, uh, that it, it works well for, do, for doing hyperparameter tuning, jointly learning your weights of your neural network and then learning some uh, hyperparameters like prior variances and uh, other things. Uh, cool, any questions so far on this? Yeah. With the Kronecker approximation, uh, it's actually quite fast. Uh, I mean, you can look at what you need to do. Uh, so you will need to go through the data and get the inputs to each layer uh, and then compute this outer product. And that's easily very fast uh, to do. And then you need to compute these uh, additional matrices. They are a bit more involved, but it's more or less the same because you, you just compute them recursively. And these are just products uh, with your weight matrices. This is the weight matrices for a particular layer. And then this is another uh, matrix. Uh, so the cost of this is going to be comparable to a, a forward pass to compute this. And then uh, you will have to uh, solve these problems, but solving these problems also is, is relatively fast because these are, I mean, you have to compute still the, I mean, ignoring this, assume that you want to compute the inverse of this, you will have to compute these inverses. And that's where the, the biggest cost is going to be. So imagine that you have a network that has 1000 units. Uh, this means that you will have to compute the inverse of a matrix, which is 1,000 by 1,000. You only need to do it once, uh, and you need to do it for each of the layers in your network, but uh, uh, it's something that you could do, uh, and, and it's, it's going to be doable. So yeah, this is, this is pretty scalable. There is, one, I mean, there is one approximation that you are doing here that I didn't mention a lot, but uh, you're assuming that the, the generalized gauss newton matrix is block diagonal. So you will have like one block for each layer, and then you just work with these uh, blocks and ignore other correlations. And that's going to be fine if you have like a relatively small network with not many layers, but it could be, if you have tons of layers, then there is, you can think that there is a lot of areas in your matrix that are uh, missing, uh, and you could have problems there. Uh, I mean, this, this has been tested on networks with, um, with many layers, uh, and it seems to work re reasonably well. Uh, there are also, I didn't mention this, but Alexander also, uh, you can use these matrices for optimization. You can have like a faster optimization techniques, uh, for example, second order based optimizers. And uh, there is a recent library released by uh, DeepMind on, based on JAX precisely implementing this, uh, the computation of this Kronecker factor approximations to the generalized gauss newton matrix and using them for optimization. And you can show that you can do a uh, way faster optimization uh, using these methods. You have to be a bit careful because you are now using second order optimizers and they can also overfit. Uh, so you have to be careful that you are not into these overfitting problems. Cool, any questions? Um, I think we can probably then leave it here uh, and go into the break directly. Yeah, I have additional work, but we will be covering this on uh, Friday. Uh, and we will look at an alternative way to scale up the Laplace approximation based on sub-network inference. The idea is to not do the Laplace approximation on all the weights of your network, but just on a subset of, of your weights. And we'll see that that actually works very well. And it can be obviously as scalable as you want by reducing the size of your network, uh, of your sub network. And uh, then we'll see some additional works on uh, how to uh, change slightly the way you implement the uh, linear Laplace model evidence approximation to improve results. And then we are going to see an application of these methods to the reconstruction of the X-ray images. Cool, I think we can go now into the coffee break and then we'll come back uh, later with the next uh, uh, session.
Thanks.